and good afternoon to everybody uh, and welcome to this morning's uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Mark Tobin, as Francesca said, I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps. Uh, some of you I, I, I may have met uh, in my previous roles uh, when I was at Wilson Asset Management. So I used to work with Jeff Wilson and Chris Stott and Matthew Kidman, uh, who, as you well know, Wilson Asset Management, uh, I guess, one of the leading LIC managers in, in Australia, if not the, the leading LIC manager at this stage. Uh, we used to be on the investor road shows all around the state capitals and we presented at a few ASA events uh, down through the years when I was there. So hopefully there'll be a few people who know me already. Uh, quick compliance and disclaimer slide. So just a quick uh, bit of background on Coffee Microcaps. So Coffee Microcaps uh, can be, I guess, say how is a financial media and events company. Uh, these days we're only doing virtual events. So I run a Coffee Microcaps morning meeting, uh, generally every Thursday morning from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. Sydney time. And we generally have two ASX Microcap companies on presenting, which roughly breaks down into a 20 minute presentation from the company and, and then we throw it up into 10 minutes uh, Q&A at the end. Uh, previously, we have done live in-person events, uh, mainly in Sydney. Uh, the plan was in 2020 to roll out the live events to some of the other state capitals, uh, but uh, COVID paid to those uh, expansion plans, but hopefully we will get to uh, that strategy uh, at a later stage. As Francesca mentioned, I also write a weekly paid subscription newsletter uh, where I profile one interesting ASX microcap stock every week. Uh, you can find that on the Substack newsletter platform. Uh, it's $20 a month plus GST or $220 for the annual subscription. Uh, please note I'm not a broker, financial advisor, corporate advisor, fund manager, or an IR rep, um, and I don't own any kind of microcap stocks to avoid kind of all conflicts of interest and all sorts of compliance issues. Um, uh, just kind of preserves the independence of uh, the newsletter as well. Uh, I tend to focus on industrial microcaps, and my kind of definition of industrial microcap is anything outside the resources and the biotechnology sector. Um, so that could be you know, microcap uh, financial services, microcap retailers, uh, hardcore industrial products or industrial services businesses, um, microcap technology names. So it's really a, a catch-all term for any of those sectors outside the resources and the biotechnology side. Uh, you can follow Coffee Microcaps at Twitter is probably the best place to follow us. Uh, I also have a YouTube channel where the recordings of those morning meetings that I talked about that we run on a Thursday, they go up uh, every Friday morning. So if you can't uh, join us for any of those live events, you can can watch it back. And as I said, the Substack uh, newsletter platform where you can sign up for my newsletter. So the title of today's presentation, uh, ASX Microcaps, The Weird and the Wonderful. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to kind of give people an overview uh, uh, of ASX Microcaps, um, you know, what it is, you know, how do I define it, how do others define it, and some of the, some of the issues uh, and nuances of, you know, looking at these like really smaller companies uh, listed on the ASX. Um, so we're going to look at, you know, what is a microcap? What does the ASX microcap market actually look like? And then, you know, if, you, if you're thinking about investing in microcaps, you know, what are your options maybe from a unit trust managed fund perspective, ETFs and indeed this investment companies perspective, or if you're thinking of, you know, direct shares, I know a lot of ASA members like to, you know, do a lot of their own direct investing. So we, we, we'll talk about uh, some of the things to look at there. So what is a microcap? Um, the, I guess the 
American guys would say it's anything under kind of 300 million in market cap. And, you know, if you use the exchange rate, that's about 400 million Australian dollars. Uh, and they're very, I guess, crystal clear on that. You know, you speak to anybody in the US or you read any media, you know, they all talk about the 300 million ceiling. In Australia, I find there's no real hard and fast rule. Um, you know, a lot of the fund managers who operate in this space will say it's 300 million. Some push it up as high as 500 million. Others will say, you know, it's more based on kind of an index or a benchmark. So they'll say it's anything outside of the ASX 200 could be classified as a micro cap. Some will say it's anything outside the ASX 300. So there isn't really a hard and fast rule I find in Australia. It's it's kind of a bit open to um, people's own interpretation. I myself use 300 million Australian um, and you know, why don't I just use, you know, the 400 million when you FX the, up this, the US number. I use the 300 million because, you know, Australia is a smaller capital market in, than the US. You know, it's got a smaller pool of companies. Um, so I kind of feel like, you know, the 300 million is a, is a good ceiling to have in terms of these um, micro cap companies. Um, not a lot of people will probably be aware, but the ASX does have its own microcap index, uh, the ASX Emerging Companies Index. Um, most people will probably be familiar with the ASX uh, Small Ordinaries Index or the ASX uh, Small Industrial Index. You'll see that a lot of the small cap fund managers uh, will use that as their as their benchmark. Um, the index, I guess, if we compare it to the ASX 200, you know, it's 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 materials are, are kind of junior resources um, heavy. Uh, you know, a lot of junior resources names down the down the bottom end. You know, it's about 35% of the index. Um, but you know, that would then compare to you know, if you look at the 200, you've got 30% in financials, which is you know obviously the big four banks, and then 20% in materials, which is you know your Rios, Fortescues, and BHPs. Um, you know, but the 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 second biggest sector is healthcare, and the next one after that is technology. So, and, and these do change around. You know, if, if I I went back and looked from from two years ago, and actually technology was actually the biggest sector, and obviously with the kind of boom that we're seeing in commodities in the last. 12 to 18 months since uh, COVID started and, and coming out of COVID, you know, we've seen the materials and the junior resources kind of pick up ahead of steam and they've kind of grown to be the, the biggest market sector in the index currently. Uh, the median market cap within the emerging companies index is only 254 million. And, you know, depending on which stock screener you use, um, it'll throw up about 1,500 stocks under that 300 million uh, market cap. So, you know, if you think there's a little over 2,000 stocks listed on the ASX, you know, the vast majority of stocks listed on the ASX actually you could put into a micro cap uh, bucket and just say, you know, it's, it is a micro cap, even if you use the, the, the 300 million. About 10% of those 1,500 are dividend paying. Now that is, I would say, maybe historically low. Again, I went back two years ago and you know that number was kind of closer to 20%. So, you know, COVID has really disrupted dividend payments, you know, right across the index from top to bottom. And, you know, it's hard to, hard to see it staying that low. So, I, it's a common misconception as well you know a lot of people think of micro cap companies as you know unprofitable you know constantly raising capital but there's actually a lot of really great uh, little stocks down there that are you know already profitable uh, paying dividends a lot of them paying fully frank dividends so you know it varies widely you know so you you'll get these themes in the market where you know resources are big you know uh, technology is like very hot and same with like dividends you know they they can vary up and down quite rapidly more so than you will find um in the asx 200. 
Um, so how was it kind of performed, the ASX Emerging Companies Index? I mean, it had an absolutely stellar uh, rebound, but after a, a big fall, uh, as you can imagine, through kind of February, March um, 2020, uh, and it has actually outperformed the ASX 200 now, if you look at it on a kind of one and three year basis. Um, but it had been lagging for a long time. The it actually had a, a terrible uh, rebound from the GFC. If you, if you go back and look at the actual numbers for the years, you know after eight, nine, ten, you know 2011, you know the index was down 23 percent. 2012 it was down 8 percent. 2013 down 13 percent. 2014 down 10 percent. And it, you know it really it really took a long time for balance sheets to come right for companies to get back on their feet um you know for the, the index i guess to kind of normalize itself um and, and that's just the nature of microcaps you know they it, it goes through these periods of kind of long drawdowns but then on the other hand it goes through um long periods of you know really good performance as people kind of come back to the sector uh, and new people join the sector and i mean if we if we look at 2020 um the asx emerging companies index which you know was a crazy year was up 27 percent for the year versus if we take the asx 200 you know it just eked out like 1.4 percent for for the full year on a, on a total return basis uh, and where does you know australia rank in terms of the asx microcap market in terms of performance it's actually one of the better performing ones globally uh, you know when you look at the other big microcap markets which are the UK, the US, Canada, and um, Europe to a lesser extent. Um, you know, the ASX ha has done very, very well, uh, and especially over the longer term. If you look at the, the three year, five year, 10 year performance figures of the ASX microcap market, it's actually one of the better performing ones globally and if we if we just contrast it to let's say the Canadian market and I talked about you know materials being a big portion of the Australian one when we look at the Canadian market it's even more skewed so the TSX venture exchange in Canada some people might be familiar with it's about 65 percent junior resources and then if you throw in let's say junior oil and gas names uh, in on top of that they actually split it out as a as a separate sector you know you're talking over 70 percent in what I would say are like commodity related stocks so it's a much less diversified um index than what we have here in australia and you know most people especially i find us investors that i talk to um you know equate canada and australia the same you know resource um heavy economies large land masses with small populations and they seem to think that the indexes are kind of reflective of that as well but actually if they even scratch the surface for two minutes they'll see that you know the asx microcap uh, arena is actually blessed with a broadly diversified um, index that has you know many many different sectors uh, that people can look at and investigate so if you're looking i guess to get exposure to um, microcap stocks are the asset class um, it's actually also a pretty well developed um, area of the market in terms of uh, unit trusts so there's 36 unit trusts available uh, and eight list investment companies are, are listed investment trusts and indeed my old uh, shop Wilson Asset Management have a dedicated microcap um, LIC these days and what I, what I would say about um, these is they're probably a bit off the radar for um, a lot of a lot of people, and you know the fund managers don't really promote them a lot. Um, you know, I, I think it catches most people by surprise that you could say there's you know 36 uh, unit trusts, and these are not you know unit trusts that are you know looking at small caps and have a bit of exposure to micro caps. These are actually dedicated 
micro cap strategies that these fund managers are running. But because you can't, you know, get a lot of funds under management together in a, in a micro cap product by by just by the structural nature of micro caps, you know, it's not something they promote. It's a, it's a fund they kind of have off of the side, but it's probably not their like marquee offering um, for some of these uh, bigger houses. But I mean, just to give you an idea of, you know, some of the, the bigger players who would probably be well known to most of the people on this call, you know, Ben Along, for example, have a have a microcap strategy. Uh, Ellerston, another place I used to work at, has a dedicated microcap strategy. Uh, Perpetual has a has a dedicated microcap strategy. Um, who else have we got in there? Perennial, uh, you know, another one who's got a dedicated microcap strategy. Um, and uh, Acorn da down in Melbourne, another one with a mi with a microcap strategy. So. It, it there are plenty of options I think for people to go and look at if you know your SMSF or your general kind of uh, way to access various asset classes is through the unit trust sphere or through the list investment company sphere and um, there's definitely plenty of options there to you know review chat to financial advisors about um, the fees I would say are generally higher than you will probably find for other um, actively managed funds uh, and that's again a bit of the nature of the beast of, of microcaps the you, you you can't really gather up a whole lot of assets so the fees tend to be higher to compensate for the fact that uh, it's never going to be a huge strategy and a lot of the costs for you know any unit trust are, are pretty much the same in terms of asset compliance audits um, uh, you know uh, other fees uh, trustee fees to, to actually run the fund so if you're running that on a on a smaller asset base um, in order to kind of keep the the profit margins i guess for the fund managers uh, and the asset managers you know some way viable you know the fees tend to be higher and i find it's like a 1.25% management fee and then a performance fee of about 20%. Some some are lower, some don't have any, um, but by and large, that's that's generally what you're going to find. And here's one of the weird parts of the microcap market. Most of the fund managers, for some reason, use the small arts as their benchmark, even though the product is a microcap uh, focused product and there is a <laughs> ready made microcap ASX microcap index there for them uh, to use as the benchmark. Uh, I'm not sure why that is and um, why they just automatically default first, um, but you will find that most of them reference the small odds as their benchmark. Again, one of the quirks of this end of the market. ETFs, index funds, I mean, have been uh, the trend in the uh, funds management world for the best part of the last decade. Um, but there is no ETF or index fund available for microcaps. And you might think, oh, that's like a gap in the market for iShares or beta shares or one of those guys. But actually, there is a structurally challenged problem to actually do uh, a microcap ETF uh, and an index fund. And it, let me just pack out like why that is. So you put together an ETF that, let's say, you know, tracks the ASX Emerging Companies Index. You know, microcaps, you know, become the asset class in vogue of the day and you get a lot of people like buying the ETF. So as more money comes into the ETF, they have to buy more stocks, uh, buy more of the underlying stocks that pushes up the prices, pushes up the market caps. Now you've got an ETF that's no longer reflective of the microcap uh, asset class that it's supposed to be reflecting. And you, de you then say, well, I've got this ETF. It's actually more like a, a small cap ETF rather than a micro cap ETF, which is what I wanted in the first place. 
and that is the, the problem with trying to do an ETF or, or an index fund or some passively managed vehicle that if money flows into it, it pushes up the prices and it doesn't take a lot to push up the prices in micro caps because generally you know volumes are pretty thin on the ground and you know four or five thousand shares traded in a day can actually have an outsized effect on the price the market caps go up suddenly you're over the kind of 300 million or 400 million or whatever kind of level most people agree on is is a micro cap and you get in the asset consultant world what they call uh, style drift in other words it's it's not um reflecting what it should be reflecting i.e exposure to asx microcap as an asset class uh, the other problem uh, and it's uh, this is also true for the actively managed unit trusts uh, to a lesser extent the list investment companies um you can end up that these can be subscale products um you know, as I said, you can't gather up a lot of funds under management in these products because you'll end up where, uh, and I mean, this was this can be shown in the in the small caps world as well when you go up a bit bigger. I remember Paradise Asset Management who used to be in the same building as us when I was working at Wilson's, you know, had to give back a whole load of uh, cash to their um, unit holders at one point because they were just managing too much money and it was it was too hard for them to um buy and sell without like moving the market uh, on themselves and, and it's the same with with micro caps you know you can't have a, a one billion funds under management micro cap uh, fund in australia it, it, it just be impossible to try and manage that kind of money and stay true to the strategy so that's another off-putting thing for the etf providers and um, they're the same as the unit trust you know it, it, there's costs that go along with running a product and, and offering it out to either the wholesale or the retail market, whatever it might be. And, you know, they can go and do a global ESG ETF and, you know, that can house a couple of billion without having any kind of uh, structural constraints around, you know, volumes and uh, not being able to kind of replicate and staying true to the staying true to the strategy, so a lot of them don't do it because of that as well. It's a small niche product that really isn't worth the, the, the hassle for a lot of them. Direct equities, then I know we probably have a lot of uh, shareholders here who uh, like to do their own work. Um, again, in Australia, we are, I guess lucky in one sense that we generally have everything listed on one exchange so from you know cba at the top all the way down to you know something capped at seven or eight million it's all on the asx and pretty much all available through um, whichever broking platform you use whether it's comsec or bell online uh, as opposed to if you go to somewhere like the uk where you'll have the alternative investment market, the AIM market in the UK, um, or if you go to Canada, as I mentioned before, where they've got the Venture Exchange, the TSX Venture. Similarly, in the US, you've got the two big national exchanges, the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ, and then the one below that, uh, OTC Markets, is where you'll find uh, a lot of US microcaps listed, uh, and the bottom end of the NASDAQ. Um, is, is, is another place but over there due to compliance and regulatory um, things the same in the, in the US or sorry in the UK and Canada you know these exchanges mightn't be open to your average everyday retail investor whereas in Australia we don't have that problem. You can, you know, easily buy a company capped at 20 million as easy as you can as you can buy CSL. And then if we if we look at some of the wonderful success stories that have come out of the ASX microcap uh, universe, you know, CSL is one. CSL was a microcap when it listed uh, as part of the government privatization for anybody who can remember back that far. A more recent example. Uh, Afterpay, you know, just got the, the big takeover from US Bay Square. Again, Afterpay was a micro cap. Uh, the day it listed 165 million market cap, which, uh, you know, they raised 25 million bucks at a dollar. 
it, it has been, you know, I think even by Australian standards, uh, a stunning, a stunning success and a stunning run. Uh, divided a lot of opinion over the five years uh, since it's listed um, and probably continue to do so um, but it's also one of the I think best examples and uh, I speak to people you know in the UK and the US uh, on a fairly regular basis it's one of the prime examples of um, microcaps being huge success stories over the last like four or five years and that's even on a global basis and CSL you know, started off, I think it was around 250 or 60 million when it listed, uh, you know, now today it's like the second biggest um, player in its space, you know, next to probably the Mahi Amgen from the US. So I guess my point is here, you know, there's some wonderful businesses uh, that start off in, in microcap land and, you know, CSL has taken, you know, a long time to get where it was, after pay probably a bit more of a supercharged example. Um, but it just goes to show that a lot of people have this misconception of the, the microcap space and, and probably not um, without some kind of foundation of merit. But there's not all kind of spoofs and spruikers uh, down this end of the market. There are actually some really good businesses. Now, one of the, I guess, problems, uh, uh, more probably problem is the wrong word, just one of the realities is probably a better def, um probably a better word to use in this sense is, you know, down this end of the market, there is a lack of broker research. So you won't get Morgans or Bells or Canaccord or any of the kind of more retail focused um, brokers covering a lot of these stocks. Um, it doesn't make sense for them to do it uh, for a number of reasons. So you'll just, the, the only thing you'll have to work off of is, you know, what the company reports at the ASX, whether they're an Appendix 4C reporting company or they're just filing their financials, you know, every six months um, in August or February generally. So there's a lot of do-it-yourself research, unfortunately, uh, down this end of the market. But having that lack of research by the broken community who then, you know, feed that research and the idea flow through to the fund managers means you can you know you can find some pretty good stories that are uh, kind of running under the radar of the institutional managers and this is like one of the key things i say to people who are you know looking at at microcap stocks is, is you can definitely get an advantage on the on the institutional guys for a number of reasons one the lack of broker research so the brokers are not covering it so they're not pitching these uh, research ideas to their clients and their clients being institutional fund managers so that's one if we go back to you know how many stocks are actually down here uh, you know 1500 it is nearly impossible for anybody to cover all of these stay on top of every story with you know ceo changes and turnarounds and write downs and moving into new markets and product launches and capital raisings to fund this acquisition you know there's so much going on on a, on a daily basis that is impossible for anybody to stay on top of it um, just to give you like a a, a working example uh, if you're working as a sell side analyst for morgans for example or bells any of those guys, you're probably in-depthly covering 12 to 14 stocks. Um, and that's probably linked to particular sectors. So, you know, Bells will have their financials guide, they'll have their resources guide, they'll have their uh, retailing consumer products person uh, that might cover even one or two more sectors. But they're probably in-depthly covering 12 to 14 stocks. They're probably keeping an eye on probably maybe another double that again, maybe another 12 to 14. So on a daily basis, they're really focused on about 25 stocks. So if you wanted to really cover the micro cap end of the market, if we say, you know, a person is looking at 25 to 30 stocks, I mean, divide that into 1500, that's the size of an analyst army that you would need to keep on top of the micro cap market. And again, small scale products, even in the 
active manager space, you know, those unit trusts and links that have managed, you know, they have maybe the portfolio manager and one analyst or two portfolio managers, you know, you know, you know how long it takes to do a bit of research on, on some of the companies. They're doing more in-depth research. So again, they can't be looking everywhere um, either. So I think it, it, it is one of the few places left in uh, financial services are asset management where you know the, the retail investor is ahead if if not uh, at least on par with um, institutional managers screens oh people love to run screens I would say on screens my experience is um, it's a it's a lot less uh, what shall I say it's a lot less true that the the companies that come out in a screen for if you're basing it on microcaps uh, compared to ASX 200, I, I find that the data that goes into a lot of these screens, you know, for the ASX 200 names, it's pretty much accurate all of the time. It's not that true and accurate when you start looking at, at microcaps. I often run a screen just to see um, how accurate it is, and I'll have you know, a list of names of stocks that I think should be coming up in the screen. And nearly all the time, it's like missing out three, four names that I know, because I've just looked at the financials from, you know, whether they were February or they're coming up in August. Okay, running this screen based on whatever, you know, criteria you want, and, you know, four of the names are like missing out of it, um, is uh, just highlights like that the screens are like very hit and miss. Um, I generally don't use them at all when I'm like looking for kind of interesting microcap names. I tend to focus on just uh, going through ASX announcements uh, on a daily basis. So at the end of kind of every day, I'll click down through all the ASX announcements and just see is there kind of any interesting ones that pop up. Usually it's those ones with the little red exclamation mark so that you know cuts down the amount you need to look at but uh, it's it's a good way to find um, interesting ideas access to management uh, i find access to management at the microcap level again for the retail investor is on a par if not better than uh, you know what the institutional guys um, when you look uh, especially now this is probably a, 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 an interesting little um, exercise to do as we come into reporting season you know, the back end of august and more so maybe through september when the annual reports come out and you go to the very end of the annual report and they list the top 20 shareholders in a lot of these microcaps you'll see it'll be mark tobin me holding in my like kind of personal name or somebody in their personal name uh, at comsec or or, or or bell direct or you'll have you know, Mark Tobin and family SMSF listed uh, in the top 20 shareholders. Uh, but if you were to flip that around and, and look at the same top 20 shareholders in in uh, Fortescue or CSL or Westpac, you'd, you wouldn't see one SMSF listed in that top 20 um, or very, very unlikely that you would see one. So, you know, management, they, they are looking for shareholders. They are, uh, and they are definitely interested in people who are interested in their stock because, you know, a lot of the time they find it very hard to find new investors to communicate with investors. You know, they 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 won't even get they won't get written up in the AFR. You know, they won't get kind of any of the media coverage because pretty much all of the companies in Australia kind of report in February and August. So, you know, if CSL or ResMed report the results today uh, and you also report the results, well, I know who like uh, Channel 7 are going to be calling for an interview or who's going to be on with Tom Petrovsky. It's not going to be the microcap CEO and, that, and that's for sure. Um, so, you know, management are definitely open to engaging with investors and they know like a large, they can see it from their own share registers, a large portion of their share registers is going to be made up of retail investors, you know, who are owning it through their own share trading account or through their SMSFs, whereas when you flip into the, the big end of town, it's all institutional money and that's where the focus of, of management is, is talking to the big fund managers. 
Uh, other kind of quirks are, are structural issues with it, within the microcap market. You generally can get like pretty wide um, buy and sell spreads or, or bid ask spreads in, in this market. Um, and that's just purely because my second bullet point here, volumes. You know, volumes can be, uh, you know, trade by appointment, as we used to say in some of these stocks. You know, it can go two, three, four days and, and you know, nothing gets traded. And that just forces the bid ask spread um, even wider. So, you know, it is one of the things to, to, to look at is, you know, how much is the stock trading? You know, what's kind of the average volume? Uh, be careful of kind of wide bid ask spreads. Um, another function of this market is, you know, there's a lot of capital raises that are happening uh, all of the time. And it's just by very nature of a lot of these micro cap companies, you know, they're more uh, embryonic, I would say, in terms of their uh, development. You know, they're, they're, they've got revenue, they're pushing towards profitability and, you know, they're raising money to kind of fund their growth until they can kind of self-fund it when they, you know, flip from being, you know, cash flow negative to being profitable or, you know, they're taking capital to grow the business. So it's already profitable, but they're, you know, raising $3 million to buy a competitor or, you know, fund the expansion of a manufacturing facility or something like that. Um, so, there, you know, it, by nature of the beast, there are a lot of capital raises. They can be, you know, uh, a good way to, you know, get a position in a stock, um, but they also generally come at uh, a dilute of nature, you know, they're generally raising money at a discount, but there definitely are a lot of capital raises that happen down this end of the market, much more so than you would see in the ASX top 200. Um, I want to call out, and uh, I must send this to uh, the ASA and they can distribute it as well to anyone on the call. Um, Altafox Capital, did a research paper uh, this time last year actually it was published so uh, Altafox Capital is run by a guy called Connor Haley he's uh, one of the leading kind of microcap investors in the US he did a, a research study last year looking at um, multi-baggers or stocks that had kind of 10 x over the last five years, but he looked at it on a kind of developed market basis. So Australia got included in it. And it's a it's a bit of a tome of a of a report. I think it's like six hundred odd pages. But um all in kind of presentation slide share mode. So it's actually kind of quite inter interesting to kind of flick through them, uh, especially the Australian names. But one of the things that uh, in his kind of conclusions was that he called out Australia as a market where uh, it did better than he expected uh, and better than the data would have suggested by the kind of number of stocks in there for stocks that had um, achieved multi-bagger status, which is kind of why everybody is looking for uh, in the microcap uh, end of the market. And, and, you know, it was a surprise to him uh, and the guys that he worked with. And since that uh, report has come out, you know, people go searching in the US online and they come across copy microcaps and they reach out to me. The amount of inbound inquiry that I've had from US-based uh, investors in the last 12 months has been noticeable. And I think that is going to be a feature of the microcap universe more broadly um, over this next decade. I, I've said before, I think the era of international microcap investing is upon us. I think it's going to be a theme of this decade. Not so much, I think, uh, at the retail level, but I think definitely at the institutional level, there is going to be more involvement from... Uh, microcap managers launching new products that are targeting microcaps on a, a international basis. So I think we will see, you know, US investors, UK investors, uh, who you know maybe running a UK only or a US only microcap strategy start to now launch international ones, and that will naturally feed into them looking at the Australian market and the Australian microcap market. I think as a, if it 
I'm nearly certain it will happen. And I think it'll be a huge positive for the Australian uh, market because it it brings it they bring a different perspective. Uh, they also bring liquidity, so hopefully it'll help tighten up bid ask spreads and hopefully it'll uh, tighten up uh, or improve volumes. And and I still think you know with fifteen hundred names listed here, they are not going to be able to stay across. Uh, all of the names either, so I think I think it's one extra player in there, um, which I think will be an improvement to the overall market, and it's going to start off slow. You know, I don't expect them to, you know, massively come in. I think they're feeling their way around and getting their feet wet to a, to a small extent, but I think you know once we get to the end of this decade, when we hit you know 2030, I think it will be something that. Um, will be noticeable uh, and will be uh, definitely part of the ASX microcap markets um, going forward. So that's probably something just to maybe be aware of. Um, something I haven't mentioned here that we don't have to worry about um, to a large extent in microcaps. You don't have to worry about short selling attacks or you know short selling in the, in, in the microcap world. It's just like impossible to short sell because you can't get borrow in the stock and the hedge funds and prime brokers who kind of facilitate short selling you know just just don't offer it because it's uh, again structurally uh, impossible generally for them to do it uh, the other thing you don't have to worry about um, which has died down in recent years but i know it was a big topic for a while high frequency trading and algorithmic trading um, you know, again, not possible in the in the in the microcap space. It's 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 pretty old school. You know, it's like buying, selling, simple as that. There's not a lot of kind of other complexity and issues like happening uh, in the background in the market. It's pretty straightforward and standard. So I hope that gave people a kind of a, a bit of an insight and a, and a bit of context and color to the ASX microcap market. As I said, there there's some kind of weird aspects to it in terms of you know, benchmark used by the fund managers and uh, you know volumes and bid ask spreads. Um, but there's also some like really wonderful businesses uh, I think listed uh, in this end of the market and you know CSL and Afterpay are. You know, just two examples that I, I, I pulled out, but I mean, I, I could pull out numerous other names. Uh, corporate Travel Management was another one. I, um, I remember we uh, were involved with when I was at Wilson's, that was a microcap when it listed. Um, um, ARB, you know, another one listed by the Brown family way back in the day was also a microcap when it listed. Uh, and now it's, you know, a, a, a stunning Aussie success story sells their products uh, globally. But they wouldn't have been able to do that if they didn't list and, um, you know, had the support of, you know, retail shareholders uh, throughout the last uh, ARB, I think, listed in 87. So, you know, that's 30 odd years. So, you know, there are some like really wonderful uh, businesses there, but you got, uh, kind of got to put the put the groundwork in, in to find them. Uh, and thank you for your attention and your attendance this morning. Uh, Peter, I'll throw it over to you if there are any questions. Yes, thank you very much, Mark. That was a, a very informative presentation on a, certainly an interesting area of the market. Um, quite a large um, number of stocks there and um, also some probably some hidden gems if you prepared to go looking. Um, I'm Peter Ray, ladies and gentlemen, and I'll be moderating the, the Q&A session. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to type them in. Um, we have a few coming through here, Mark. Um, we'll start off with those. Um, interesting one here. Um, have you thought of a, a fat cat index, i.e. the percentage of turnover being used to compensate executives and directors? Yeah, it's a, look, corporate governance, I think, is in the limelight, you know, right across the, right across the index. And the microcap space is uh, is no different, and the fat cat index is a is a good a is is not a bad idea. But um, you know what I always say about corporate governance: you can the executive compensation and how how it's set up. Um, you know, can probably 
tell you a lot about the overall corporate governance you know if you just look at that section in an annual report it'll give you a good idea of like um how the company is run and you know where management see shareholders as part of the the whole setup um i haven't I haven't thought of, thought about running it um but no more so than you see in the asx 200 you see like egregious uh, awards and outrageous um what shall I say? Outrageous uh, compensation schemes, but you also find that the in in places in in the two hundreds. So I don't think the micro cap end is um, any any worse or any better. Um, I think you definitely got to take it on a company by company basis. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, we've got a question here from someone who wasn't quite sure what you were talking about when you were talking about screens. Um, perhaps you could just give a bit of an explanation of how analysts use screens to, to identify particular stocks and screen out certain characteristics of the stock. Yeah, so some of the analysts or, or anybody generally, you know, they'll they'll put together a, a screen. This is generally functionality that you'll find within your Comsec account or, or, or Bell Online account where you can pick a whole load of different indicators to you know filter down so you've got call it 2000 odd stocks listed on the asx okay i want to get down to you know maybe 300 that i'm going to you know potentially do a, a little bit more work on so that could be screening them down by market cap it could be screening them down by dividend yield it could be screening them down by the sector that they're operating in so i only want to look at you know financial services companies or i only want to look at technology companies um, it could be looking at companies where you know their profitability growth is greater than 10 percent over the last year or over the last three years there's you know it's crazy how many um data points that you can filter for and screen for these days but as i said i i find you know a screen is only as good as the information going in it's it's the old you know garbage in garbage out and i find for the asx 200 uh, you know the screens work very very well i think the data whoever's putting it in there wherever it's coming from is pretty accurate but the further you get down into micro cap land as i said sometimes i run a screen just to see um does it throw up uh, what I'm expecting it to throw up, I kind of know what the answers are going to be, and you know, three or four of the kind of stocks are, are are missing for you know no obvious reason, um, and that could be you know really as simple as you know I'm screening for companies where they're actually paying a dividend, and you know I'm looking for something with a yield greater than one percent, and you know three or four of the companies I know who are kind of paying a yield of three or four percent don't even show up in it. Um, so I think screens are, you know, they, they can be useful and they, they have their place. I would just caution, you know, relying on them totally in the micro cap end to kind of uh, catch everything. If you say, okay, I run this screen, this is all of the stocks that are going to fit this criteria. I, I just find it it, it, it it misses out. And on, on the flip side, it includes ones that shouldn't be in there. Um, you know, because the data is old or it hasn't been updated uh, as uh, quickly as it should be compared to, you know, the, the top 200. So that's what I mean about screens, you know, running those screens to try and filter down into a, into a smaller research universe. Um, I would take the information or the names that it throws up with, with a bit of caution. Okay, um, hopefully that answers the um, question on screens. Thank you for that, Mark. Um, we've got a stock specific question here. I'm not sure whether you're uh, prepared or able to speak. Um, the stock in particular is John's Ling. Um, the question asks um, or says that he doesn't understand why what was a micro, uh, which is now a huge micro, has yield figures um, and price earnings ratios like an Afterpay or a Tesla that is pretty low yields and, and high very high PE ratio. So I'm not sure if you're able to comment on that one or not. Mark? No, stock I've looked at in a, in a long time. I mean, its market cap is like, I think, 
1.5 billion or something now. So it's like well out of um, my kind of coverage universe these days or, or stocks that I would even look at. Um, so I really can't talk to it. I know it's a stock that has done well. Uh, I know it's particularly well liked within the kind of institutional space. Um, you know, I see a lot of fund managers on Livewire and kind of other places, you know, calling it out as one of their key picks. So I think when you've got that kind of level of institutional support, um, it's going to help the the multiple. Uh, whether that's justified or not, um, again, a bit like Afterpay and Tesla, uh, you know, both of those names, as mentioned by the by the attendee, you know, highly divisive names within. Uh, the asset management space and maybe uh, John's Link Group is another one of those that you know completely divides opinion and uh, somebody will be right and somebody will be wrong. Okay, thank you for, for answering that, Mike. Um, we've got another question here um, on, on stocks that someone is asking if you're prepared to um, name a couple of stocks that you think have great potential in the market today. Um, yeah, I, I won't give buy sell hold recommendations um but you know stocks that i think are interesting maybe if i if i say that um i think maybe two that i'll call out would be um one would be a company called energy one um the codes eol uh, i think they're you know a very interesting little business again it's one of those like niche technology plays so they do software for um electricity and uh, and gas trading so they kind of sit in the middle between the big generators like santos and agl uh, and versus the big customers on the other side which would be you know woolworths coles mcdonald's um those type of guys you know people who are buying electricity uh, on a wholesale basis because they've got you know either a huge network of stores that they have to power or they have like kind of big energy needs uh, and to a certain extent some of the big manufacturing players uh, and you know they provide the software for the market that that trades it so it's kind of like the the asx of the energy market you know they're the exchange in between um, and it's it's starting to branch offshore now. Um, they recently uh, dipped their toe into the into the UK and the European markets, uh, and have won a few contracts there, taken over a, a business there. And it seems like their software, which they've developed themselves, you know, can be used in these other uh, energy markets. So that's probably an interesting one to to look at. It could be a, you know, an Australian. Uh, stock that's kind of starting to, to spread its wings overseas. Uh, another one that I think is interesting is uh, is Joyce Corp. Um, so they own the Bedshed franchise for anybody who knows those, uh, and they also have a, a, a kitchen and wardrobe division. So you know, very much in in that. Um, I guess home renovation, home improvement uh, section of the market that's you know done incredibly well through through COVID. You know people not spending on overseas holidays. You know looking at like renovations uh, to the house, either getting it done by somebody or you know maybe maybe tackling tackling it themselves. Um, so I think there you know two interesting ones. One you know very Australia domestic focus. The other one a solid Australia business that's now you know trying to look. Uh, internationally, I think they're you know two interesting names. If I, if I was to pick two, thanks, Mark. And just turning that around, we've got a question um, follow up. Um, what's your worst micro cap? I, I think it's probably which any particular stocks that you might like to mention that you would avoid in the, in the micro cap sector. Uh, uh, it's or, probably too many to too many to mention. <laughs> I look, you know, I think. I think with like microcaps, you know, the there's so many down there that you uh, and it's hard to find one or two or three that are you know absolutely perfect on a like valuation basis, management basis, everything. You know, the, all these stocks kind of have uh, hairs on them, as I say, compared to you know what you would find maybe ASX 200 level. 
you know it's a lot of shades of gray uh and it's you know balancing out you know what what you're comfortable with and what you're not comfortable with um to pick out one of the worst ones uh i i i won't i won't uh, divulge some of the the shockers i've seen but on the other hand you know those ones that have performed particularly badly i also keep an eye on them because you'll find um you get a lot of turnaround stories uh, down this end of the market um where you know the stocks have totally underperformed um you know through like bad management uh in a kind of previous guys new ceo or kind of new board comes in and you know kind of right sizes the business uh, very painful for previous shareholders existing shareholders um but you can't just like write off uh write off a stock or i certainly don't you know i keep an eye on them uh you know new ceos coming into microcap businesses always um perks my attention uh, because i've seen so many times where you know you've got a, ostensibly ostensibly a a good business in there you know you can tell it's like no it's just a half decent business but you know it just hasn't been like well run uh, and then if you can get good management in there through ceo board changes uh, and get it turned around it actually does like pretty well um one of the more recent examples of that i would say is a business called msl solutions so pa howard the ceo came in there i think two years ago now uh, and again it was a half decent business that had kind of lost its way um and you know wasn't uh particularly well managed by the the, the previous management team and you know pa has kind of turned it around uh kind of got her back on the straight and narrow and and you know that process has kind of taken the last two years and i think he's got it on a good footing now and but now the question is for pat like can he grow it like how is he going to grow this business um now that it's stabilized um so i think you know if people are looking you know at the history of a turnaround i think you know msl solutions is maybe one to look at in terms of a turnaround basis so i think you know even the worst micro caps i keep an eye on and um, because it's someday you know something is going to happen there where there, there's going to be a change in board or management so yeah things i do look at you know how do you find even the bad ones um so looking at kind of 52 week highs and 52 week lows i look at the 52 week lows um all the time because you know that's where you're going to see potentially changes in management or changes in strategy by the existing management where they'll be like, okay, what we've been doing hasn't been working. We need to like pull the plug on this and, you know, either refocus, um, cut down some of these growth initiatives and just get back to kind of um, basics or they're going to, you know, maybe change the business direction away from a, an industry that's um, maybe in decline into into one that's kind of more of a growth industry. Thanks, Mark. We're running up um, against time now. We do have a, a couple of questions there. I might just quickly go through a couple of them. Um, I think they um, should be quick to answer. Mark, um, you spoke about the um, difficulty with um, the structural difficulties in doing ETFs um, with microcaps. Someone has asked, um, are you aware if there are any smart beta ETFs here in Australia or overseas that do follow the microcap universe? I'm not aware of any kind of smart beta ETFs in Australia. Um, there are a couple of microcap uh, ETFs available in the US, but again, I mean, if you get the, the fact sheet off the website and I look at the kind of top 10 holdings that's, you know, in there and, you know, <laughs> the the top one or two stocks are like capped at like 1 billion and the top, all of the names in the top 10 are probably over the 300 million kind of mark that, you know, the US guys use for um, a micro cap. So it's like, you have to ask yourself, well, I'm trying to get an ETF to give me micro cap 
asset class exposure. But then when I look what's inside the ETF, the top 10 names don't even uh, fulfill that kind of basic uh, first principle approach. So um, you, you can find them in the, in the US. I'm not aware of one in Australia. Um, thanks, Mark. Um... You spoke about shorting as well and just how it's very difficult in, in the market cap market. Um, we've got a questioner here who's talking about a specific example of a gold miner which does have a very small short against it and um, he just comments that he's seen some stocks like that manipulated um, through shorting. Are you aware of uh, uh, um, instances like that at all? I think the amount of shorting that goes on at, at this end of the market is very, very small. I mean, uh, to even establish a short position in a micro cap it would take a lot of work from the fund manager in question. Um, whether they're doing it to manipulate it, manipulate it or the price uh, or not, uh, I don't know. That's probably one to uh, communicate to ASIC or the ASX. But I think even to establish a position, I think is very difficult. I rarely, rarely see um, short interest in, in micro cap names. Okay, and finally, um, Mark, you mentioned that you don't own micro caps. Have there ever been any that you've been tempted to buy, or do you, do you wait? Uh, oh, tempted to buy <laughs> all the time, but yeah, for compliance. Um, reasons uh, I don't own any uh, it just makes uh, it just makes my life so much easier but um, yeah there's there's plenty that kind of pique my interest and uh, you know I, I wish I don't um, at, var at various points in time um, but just from a yeah, compliance point of view it just makes it so much easier not owning any okay great uh, thanks Mark you've answered the um, question as well um, again, thank you so much for enlightening us all on a very interesting area of the market. Um, so any of our members who are interested can um, go to your website, which you might like to remind us of again. Yeah, so the website is uh, coffeemicrocaps.com. Uh, they can reach out to me on Twitter or the field if anybody's got kind of follow-up questions or I think they can email me. It's just uh, mark at coffeemicrocaps.com. Terrific. Thank you, Mark. Um, before we conclude, just a reminder to those listening in that our Thursday webinar is on at um, 12 o'clock on Thursday. The, the topic this week is top ASX 200 rated companies for ESG. So ESG is, is a very, very topical issue at the moment. Um, a lot of the institutional investors are paying a lot more attention to ESG investing. So this, this should be quite a, a, a very informative and, and topical webinar. So don't forget to, to register for that webinar on Thursday. Thank you everyone for joining in and thank you Mark and um, have a good afternoon everyone. Cheers. Thanks Peter. Thanks everyone.